And if you got a bulletin, you can uh, look. It's actually on the very back of it that there's several things that are listed. And so if you are a young lady or an old lady or a middle-aged lady or whatever, if you are a woman, uh, you can look at that and you can see all the different things that are going to be coming up in the life of our church uh, that may interest you. And I know that they have a desire to draw from all different groups of people, um, as long as you're a woman, of course. But uh, to spend some time together and to see what's going on and to, and to really start ramping up some of these ministries uh, that due to COVID have been down for a while and uh, we're at the stage where we really want to start seeing those uh, pick back up again. And uh, I know that a lot of work has been put into those uh, that are coming up. And so I encourage you to check that information out of things that are going on there. Um, also, uh, tonight there is a ministry praise and report service where we invite our ministry leaders uh, to share with the church, the congregation, of different things that are going on in their various ministries. And so if you want more information about what is going on in the life of our church, what ministries are happening, and how can I be involved in those things, and what can I do with that, then I encourage you to come and hear an update. Uh, it's also uh, the place where we as a church conduct any needed business that we need to take care of, and that's an important part of being part of our church, of being a family, uh, part of this family that we have gathered here together, is having those conversations and doing those things. Uh, but uh, I encourage you to please get a bulletin to read through that to see what's going on. There is one announcement that I need to make uh, that is specifically directed at parents that have children, and so I am talking to myself right now. You may see that there's a couple of new things that are up on our stage right now. There's a, a drum set, there's some wires and microphones and things like that. There's some new equipment that's been set up, and so Whereas we've normally been very free and open about children walking all over and coming up on the stage and, and doing things, and that doesn't bother us. Just out of an interest of their safety and health, we, we don't want them running up here after the service is over to possibly trip and get hurt uh, or on anything up here. And so parents, uh, myself included, if, if we, you would normally let your children have free reign, just be mindful of that. Ask them to not be on the stage and just be watching out for them, um, if you would, please. Uh, I'd like to begin our service by reading from a passage of Scripture. We're going to read Psalm 138 this morning, and then I will uh, continue the service uh, by praying, and we can sing together. Psalm 138 says, I will give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name, and your word. On the day I called you, answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, as we come to you together, as people who have been redeemed by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are gathered together and we, we read this psalm and we are reminded of your faithfulness, that you are faithful. You answer us when we call in the day of trouble, when we need your help. Lord, even though you are high and lifted up, you regard the lowly and the humble. Lord, those we are here in I often feel as if we are the lowest part of your creation, Lord. You, you address us, you speak to us, you reveal yourself to us in a way that, that we do not deserve to even know you. But in your grace and in your kindness, you seek to know us. And you desire for us to know you. And Father, you are faithful to us even though after you have in your kindness done all of these things, have been unfaithful to you. Lord, the only reason each one of us is able to stand here this morning and sing praises to your name is because of your grace and your kindness towards us. So, Father, would you help us now? 
Would you help us lift up our voices in true praise to you, not distracted by the things of this world, not allowing the things of this world to discourage us in that, but Lord, would you allow us now, even though many things in our lives change throughout the years, you are the one constant. You never change, and you are always worthy of our praise. So would you help us worship you this morning? We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. all of you here this morning. I'm glad you're here uh, to worship with us. 
As many of you know, today's an exciting day in the life of the church. We do have uh, Pastor Dave Arnold with us this morning. Pastor Dave is here as a candidate for our Minister of Missions and Music that we have been searching for, and so we're thankful to have him here this morning. I hope that when you walked in, you got a bulletin, and with your bulletin, you got a sheet. It looks like this. It's front and back. It has a little bit about Dave. It's something that Anna put together uh, this week from his resume that you'll, you can look over and see. Uh, with Dave this morning is his family. I know he looks alone over here, but they are over here. I don't want to embarrass them, but his wife Angie, his son Luke, and his daughter Lena are here with him. Today at 4 o'clock, at 4 p.m., back in the fellowship hall, will be a time for a meet and greet. So it'll be a time for you to come to meet him, to meet his family. Uh, back in the fellowship hall, like I said, we'll have uh, just a few things to eat, not a meal, so don't come starving. We're not going to satisfy that for you. Uh, but there are some cookies and some different things for you to snack on back there. And so I hope that you'll be able to come, be able to talk to him, uh, meet Dave face to face. But we do have him coming this morning uh, to preach, uh, to preach the word of God. And some of you might say, well, why is he not leading music if it's for missions and music? He's doing that next week. He'll be here next week. So you have to come in two weeks in a row. I know that's tough. I know it's tough. But for two weeks in a row, you'll have to come uh, to be able to see him. But I believe it is very important for a pastor to preach. It's one of the distinctions of being a pastor in Scripture, is that he's able to teach and to preach. And so that is why we want him to be able to preach first. And so he'll be, he'll be leading us this morning, uh, I believe out of the book of Acts, chapter 13, is where he'll be preaching from. And so again, I want you to take this sheet. Uh, you can be able to, you can look all of that over. And after we sing a song here in a moment, Pastor Dave's going to come and he's going to lead us by preaching the Word of God. And so we trust that he'll do that uh, this morning. I want to read this morning from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And I want to encourage you in the church and as the church in something. At the Welcome Centers, you'll find a sheet of paper for reading through, scripture, reading through the New Testament throughout the year. This is something we want to do as a church family. And it's not intimidating at all. It's like one chapter for five days a week. That is it about one chapter, five days a week. And so this week would have been Matthew 1 through Matthew 5. And I want to encourage you to be a part of that. We're going to try to incorporate this into our service each week. And also Pastor Spencer is going to do a podcast each week concerning those different chapters for you to be able to listen to. And so today's reading is from one of our readings from this week. It's the temptation of Jesus, the first 11 verses of Matthew 4. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This morning, we have the privilege to worship this same Jesus, the one who has done what we, we could not. We read here how he conquers Satan, but we know that later he would conquer him finally on the cross and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. You and I this week, no doubt, were tempted. Sometimes you could look back and you could say, I nailed it. I succeeded. I didn't fall. But we all know, each one of us, that throughout this week, there are times we knew that we, we fell. But we're here today to worship together the one who didn't fall. And he didn't fall on your behalf. You are seen in the eyes of Christ through Jesus' blood as perfect, as righteous, as holy, because he is perfect, righteous, and holy. And so we have the privilege to worship him today, our Savior and our King. Let's bow. Let's pray. 
and then I'll have you stand. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for our King. We thank you for our Savior. We thank you that we get to sing praises to his name. He alone is worthy of that praise. And so, God, as we gather this morning, many of us from many different areas, many different things going on in our life, God, but those of us who've been saved by your grace through faith, we gather together with one purpose, the understanding that Jesus is our Lord and he deserves all glory and praise. And so, God, we want to do that this morning to the best of our abilities. God, even in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our struggle, you, by your good grace, have provided for us uh, victories, times in our life this week where maybe we've seen growth in our spiritual walk with you, maybe times when we overcame temptation. And God, we thank you for those times, and we pray that, that those would multiply. But God, we also know of times we've failed, and so we seek your face, we seek forgiveness, and we're thankful that forgiveness is given and that it's promised to us. And so God, as we worship you this morning, hear our praise, hear our worship, and our feeble attempts to do it the best that we can, we pray that it would be honoring to you above all things. And so help us to honor you with our singing. We pray for Pastor Davis. He's going to come and preach in a moment. We pray that he honors you through the preaching of your word. And God, while I know it can be uncomfortable being here as a candidate and even sitting and listening, God, I pray that we would understand we're not here to judge. We're not here even for a job interview. We are here to hear your word preached. And so, God, I pray that you would prick our hearts. I pray that you would open our eyes to your truth, that we would love you even more as we walk out of this room a little later. So, God, to you belongs all glory and all praise. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand with me this morning, we're going to sing in a moment, but I do want to release our boys and girls to Children's Church. So, parents of those who, are, who have kids four to five years old. Uh, you can take your children to room 101. Do make sure that you sign in at one of the kiosks there. And I failed to mention uh, last week, I know the parents are walking out so they're not listening to me now, but you can actually sign in before Sunday school. You can sign in before church. You don't have to do it right now. It'll make it quicker. So as they go, we're going to sing together. So let's sing, all right?
be seated. Good morning. It's great to be with you all this morning. Let me pray as, and we'll, we'll get started here in a moment. Lord Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day that we can come into your house of worship and to, to listen to your word and to, uh, to be in fellowship with one another. We thank you, Lord Jesus, as we just sang this song that you do, in fact, speak to us. Your word is the word of truth. And Lord, now, as Pastor Tim prayed already, we pray that, your, uh, that our hearts would be receptive to what you would want to say to us, that the preaching of the word would go forth. We are thankful that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Lord, I pray that you would direct us, take us by the hand, Holy Spirit, and lead us and open our eyes and encourage us, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to express my gratitude to Pastor Tim and to the search team for this opportunity to be here with you all this morning. And it's a real privilege, and we're looking forward to being back again next Sunday to do worship, and we're working toward that. It's very exciting uh, just to be with you all this morning. I didn't grow up in Monroe. Uh, I've been here now, let's see, about six years. My daughter was, uh, just had turned two years old, and my son was almost going to turn five. So they're, they've basically been raised here, and we moved from the city to, uh, to Monroe. We're actually in Maybe, the little, the little thriving metropolitan area of maybe Michigan, and um, brown, Little Brown Jug is kind of the, the highlight there, I guess, if you will, the center. But um, it's, a, it's a great place. We love it, and we're so grateful. So kind of a funny story, I was just started pastoring here in Monroe, and I was, I was just getting into it. I think I'd been to church for a couple weeks, and you know, old, older congregation, and I was preaching in, in the Sunday evening service. And I was just getting into my text, and an older gentleman who's from Kentucky, but you know, been in Monroe for, Monroe for years and years, he stood up in the middle of my sermon. True story. He stood up and said, Pastor, I understand that you can, you can speak some Greek and Hebrew, you know, because he knew that I'd gone to seminary and I learned Greek and Hebrew and whatever, whatever. He's like, but I have a question for you. Can you speak hillbilly? And then he sat down. <laughs> I'm like, uh, no, I, I I, I don't think so. I'd never been asked that question before, but I'll, I'll work on that. So it was uh, quite, a, quite an experience, and I, I, I didn't, didn't know kind of how to engage that. But, you know, we, we love Monroe, and what's, what's wonderful about being here is, is it's, it's such a family community. You know, having young kids myself, and we homeschool, and there's a great homeschool community here in Monroe. We, we just feel very at, at home here, and it's just a, a wonderful place, and I'm just so thankful to be with you all this morning. So my hope for this sermon is twofold. Number one is go, I'm going to preach the text. I'm going to preach the word, which we'll look at here in a moment in Acts chapter 13. And then number two is I want to share my story with you. I want you to get to know me and to kind of understand what the Lord has done in my life, to kind of have a, a, an idea of, of, of the redemptive work of Christ in my life. And so with that said, I want to turn your attention to the book of Acts. You can open up your Bibles if you have, or you can look on the screen. We're just going to look at a few verses this morning. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. I have two ideas for this sermon. Number one is the word medley medley. The definition of medley means a varied mixture of people or things, such as an interesting medley of flavors. It's often used as a musical term, and medley has the idea of a type of song that takes multiple different songs and plays them all together, one after the other. The idea of medley is diversity within unity. The second term is the term marked off. So medley and marked off. To be marked off means to be separated, to be set apart, to be sent out on a purpose or a task or mission. And so the idea of this sermon is twofold. One is that we make up the medley of the kingdom of God. We are the body of Christ. 
I know your pastor is going through the book of Ephesians, which is, which is talking about the, what does it mean to be the body of Christ? What does it mean to live as the hands and feet of Jesus in this world? And what's unique about that is that although we are unified as a body, we each make up different parts. Your story is not like my story. Your neighbor's story is not like your story. And so we, are diff- we have different personalities, we have different giftings, different talents, different backgrounds, different struggles, different pain, different suffering, but it all makes up the medley of the body of Christ. And the second idea is that we are all called to a purpose. God has given you the DNA, if you will, of doing what he has called you to do. He has called you to a specific purpose and task. And I've said this before and I'll continue to say it, is it's never too late to be who God has called you to be. It's never too late to do what God has called you to do. There are people that, especially as they get older in life, they say, oh, you know what? I can't do you know, these things. I can't do God's will because I've, I've squandered my time or I'm older now. It's never too late. God called Moses when he was 80, right? It's never too late to do what God's called you to do and to be what God's called you to be. And so let's jump in. Acts chapter 13. The first, again, the word is medley. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Here is the first missionary church. Antioch is the first missionary church. This is where missions began, if you will, as Barnabas and Saul, who became Paul, as you know, were sent off. Now, Antioch was a unique place, just a little bit north, not not close to Damascus, but further north of Damascus, right on the border of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, and Syria. It was called Syrian Antioch, and it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And because of its location by the Mediterranean Sea, it drew in cultures from all over, from the east and from the west and from Africa, and it was a multicultural cosmopolitan city. In fact, Herod the Great the Herod of the Christmas story, paved the main roads of Antioch in marble. A lot of money came through because of the trading industry and so forth. And here we see the gospel movement exploding in the city of Antioch, exploding there. In fact, it was Barnabas. We're going to talk more about Barnabas in a little bit. The church of Jerusalem told Barnabas, go and see what's happening in Antioch. They had heard that Gentiles were coming to Christ. And so Barnabas goes, and chapter 11 of, of, of the book of Acts, it says that, that Barnabas, being a good man, full of the Spirit of God and faith, he sees the grace of God in Antioch, and he's excited about what God is doing and decides to stay there and become a leader of the church in Antioch. And so here we have the city Antioch, and just like modern-day London or Chicago or New York, it was multicultural and cosmopolitan. My wife and I had the privilege of being involved in church planting for quite some time when we lived in Chicago. My son was born in Chicago. We lived in a neighborhood called Albany Park, northwest side of the city, about six miles from downtown, which is called The Loop. And we were part of the Southern Baptist Convention, and we were working with the North American Mission Board, and they had supported us as church planters. And our neighborhood, three mile square radius or so, a neighborhood, had 60 different languages represented. 60. The whole world was in our neighborhood. We were working with people from the Middle East, from uh, refugees from Burma, Myanmar, refugees from uh, former Cam- or Cambodia and former Yugoslavia and so forth. We were, we were there, and the world was at our doorstep. So it was in Antioch. Antioch was a melting pot, a multicultural urban center, and this is where the gospel exploded. So it says in Antioch there were prophets and teachers, and then Luke, the gospel, or excuse me, the, the writer of the, the book of Acts, the human writer at least, mentions five. Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. Barnabas was the encourager. We'll talk more about him. Simeon, who was called Niger, most scholars believe, including F.F. Bruce and others, that Simeon was, in fact, from Africa, an African Christian, a leader in the church. Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is modern-day Libya, North Africa. So again, African descent. And Menian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, Saul who became Barnabas, or excuse me, Paul the Apostle. Now it's interesting that uh, Luke mentions Menian. Now Menian, most scholars believe, was the uh, close friend or the adopted brother of Herod the Tetrarch. Tetrarch means ruler, also known as Herod Antipas. Now Herod was the son of Herod the Great. Remember the Herod the Great of the Christmas narrative? 
That was his son was Herod the Tetrarch. And scholars believe that Menian grew up in the palace alongside of the Herod family and at some point had heard the gospel and accepted Jesus and then came to Antioch where he was a leader of the church. So here we see a very interesting medley of Christian leaders here in the book of Acts. And what Luke is doing is he's showing that Jesus, when Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, you shall be my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here we see Antioch is the ends of the earth. Why? Because the world had come there, just like our urban centers today. I mean, even where we live, small town, rural, maybe Michigan, we have families from Palestine that live down the street from us. Palestinian Muslim people. And so the world is here. And so it was in the days of Barnabas and Paul, Antioch. And so what Luke is showing is that the, the, the gospel, the great commission that Jesus had told his disciples was coming to fruition the missio dei, the mission of God, was exploding in Antioch. Now, I'm going to switch now and transition to my own story, and then we'll go back to the text. I grew up in an Antioch type of setting when I was in my formative years as a young person up until I went to college. And what I mean by that, there was two main things that I, two main components that I, that I grew up around. Number one was cultural diversity. I grew up in the suburbs outside of Washington, D.C., about 22 miles west of D.C. in Fairfax County, a town called Herndon, Virginia. If you fly into D.C., oftentimes you'll fly into Dulles Airport. That's where the town that I grew up in is, is where Dulles Airport is located. And from the time I remember growing up there is I had friends from all over the world. It's a large Asian population, people, families from Vietnam and Cambodia and South, and South Korea and China and Japan. And then North Africa, middle, the Middle East, I had, I had a friend in high school from Pakistan. My best friend in high school was second generation Chinese. You know, we'd be, we'd be hanging out in his bedroom, you know, playing guitar and having a good time. And his mom would come in and start speaking Mandarin to him. And he would just switch and just start speaking Mandarin Chinese with her and then go back to, to, to hanging out with me and speaking English. And that was my context. I, I, I remember going to school and you know, you, you, you get to know people and get to know other kids that had names that were very hard to pronounce, very difficult or different than yours. And so I was around diversity. The Northern Virginia area is very multicultural. The second thing I was surrounded by was music. My dad, at a, at a young age, I remember driving with, with my dad and, and going, you know, to places, and he would be playing his favorite genre of music, oldies, you know, the Motown greats, you know, from the 50s and 60s, which is kind of interesting because years later, I would actually relocate or move to Motown, to Detroit, our Detroit area. And I remember being exposed to music at a very young age. And then my dad got into the promotional aspect or the promotional part of, of music, the business part, where he would work at these venues and he would book these concerts. And so he'd bring in these Motown groups like the Temptations and the Four Tops, you know, these, these, uh, these classic groups. And I got to meet them. You know, I'm like, 11, 12, 13 years old, and I just started playing guitar, and I was meeting musicians like from New York City that were doing studio work, that were doing backup for these, these groups, and so I was surrounded by culture, surrounded by books, going to libraries as a kid, you know, going into Washington, D.C., and going to the museums. I didn't realize until I moved to the Midwest that museums were not free, because <laughs> you go to Washington, you walk around the mall, you go to all the museums, they're free. I remember going to Chicago when I was in college, and I'm like, wait, it costs how much to get into this museum? What? No idea. So I grew up in culture. I grew up in music. But then my life took a drastic turn. I'll never forget I was 10 years old, and, and I knew there were problems in my home. I heard the fighting. I heard the contention between my parents. I wondered why, even at a, as, as a little boy, that dad wouldn't come home until late at night, staying late in the office, or why on the weekends, dad would take us out to eat or to the movies, but mom wouldn't come. And then I remember as a 10-year-old boy, my, my, my sister was eight, my parents called us downstairs to have a talk. And my mom said, you know, your dad and I have been having problems for some time now, and we've decided to get a divorce, and dad's going to move out tonight. 
and then I saw his bag in the corner. Thankfully, he stayed close. He did buy a house in Maryland on the other side of Washington, but he had an apartment close to us. But that just rocked my world. If you've gone through divorce and you know what that's like, you know how hard that is. But I did the classic thing, typical in in some ways of, of being a boy maybe, or just a human being in general, is I started to stuff it all down. I pushed all that pain and all that anger and all that guilt, because I thought maybe I did something, because I was a very active kid. I got into trouble a lot in school, not because I was bad, but I was just talking and active and kind of just having fun with other kids, you know, and I would get, I would get scolded and be sent to the principal office sometimes. And so I began to kind of rumorate in my mind about this situation. Well, maybe I could have done something different to prevent my, my dad from leaving. And so I stuffed it all and stuffed it all. And you know that if you stuff your pain, it's eventually going to come out, right? It's eventually going to come out. And it started to come out when I got into high school. I was very angry, just angry, just had this kind of edge about myself. But thankfully, and this is where music comes back into play, I could have gone down a very dark path. I had friends that were going down a dark path getting involved in drugs and all that. But I poured myself into music. I would come home from school. I came home to an empty house because my mom had to go back to work. We had to downsize, and so she was working. I'd come home to an empty house, and I'd get my guitar, and I would play for hours, sometimes two, three hours. I wanted to be the next, you name it, guitar hero, Jimi Hendrix or Eddie Van Halen or whatever. And so I started pouring myself into playing guitar, and that kept me off the streets. It kept me off of, out of drugs and all that. And so as I was doing that, I got into bands. And my band in high school, we, we started, I started in bands in junior high. And we were bad, you know, typical garage band. And then I got into more serious bands. And we were really good. We cut two albums. We were playing all of my mom kind of let, let me kind of have whatever. She just said, I trust you. You don't have a curfew. That could have been dangerous. But again, I was immersed in music, and so I didn't do anything crazy. But we were out playing gigs in, in downtown Washington, D.C., or, you know, suburban, you know, in Maryland, or suburban uh, D.C. area, and playing music like crazy. But I was lost, and I was broken, and I was angry. And music, like anything else, food or entertainment or whatever, it can't fill the void. It can't. Only Jesus can. Now, I grew up Catholic, pretty, pretty large, our big Catholic area, Catholic and Lutheran, kind of like Monroe, actually, in some ways. Not a lot of Bible churches, not a lot of doc, good doctrine or, or gospel type of churches in the D.C. area at that time growing up. And so I went to Catholic church, but my mom growing up in all Catholic girls' school up until college and got married at a very young age and basically was done with the Catholic church. Kind of one of those things where she'd play piano when she she was a little girl and the nuns were watching over her and she missed a note, whack, whack her on the knuckle. Yeah, that's going to really leave a good impression for a kid (laughs) regarding the, the, the church, right? And so after I went through confirmation, that was it. My parents didn't go to church, so why would I? So I believed in God, but it was a concept. I believed God was kind of like a cosmic cop waiting for me to do something wrong to bust me. And so again, I'm stuffing all this pain and all this stuff going on, and I'm just angry, I'm disillusioned, and all that. But that is where, in the midst of that, when I was 17 years old, my junior year in high school, where I felt invisible, I had no sense of belonging because, again, music couldn't fill that. But it was then that I met a Barnabas, an encourager, and it changed the whole course of my life. I'll get back to that in a moment. Let me go to my second point here this morning. So first we see the word medley, which means a mixture, an assortment. We are the body of Christ, but we all have different stories. Why am I sharing my story? Because it's different. It's different than your story so that we can relate and understand and see and encourage one another to what Christ has done in our lives and how our pain and your, you know, our pain and, and our suffering is all a part of the work and the redemptive plan of Jesus Christ. 
Now I turn to the second idea, and that's the word marked off, to be set apart. Verse 2, while they, who are the they? That is these leaders that were just mentioned. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So two ideas here, while they were worshiping. This word worshiping means serving the Lord. Why they were just doing daily, their daily life, raising their kids and working their jobs, meeting together in fellowship, why they were worshiping the Lord in, that, in the midst of doing that, the Holy Spirit began to work and speak. Now, it's used as a participle. Participle, if you remember your grammar, means an ongoing action. It's not just a one-time thing. It didn't say when they worshiped at some point. No, as they were worshiping continually worshiping, and that is to be the posture of our heart. As, as a part of my, my passion as a pastor is I want to help the body of Christ. I want to help Christians understand that worship is an attitude. It's not just about singing. Singing is a big part of it. We have the hymn book, if you will, of the, of the Bible, the Psalms. It's a big part of it, but worship is an attitude. It, the idea is to give worth to something, you're giving value. You're giving worth. Paul says, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, you do it all for the glory of God. And so as they were doing that, as they were worshiping, as they were serving the Lord, being faithful, raising their kids, doing life, and they were fasting, again, a participle, ongoing. They were doing this continually, ongoing. At that point, the Holy Spirit said, if you will, the idea, I believe, is this. The church was functioning and moving and praying and saying, you know, God, how can, we, how can we reach more people? How can we be more about the gospel? And then the Holy Spirit got their attention, and that's often the case, right? And he begins to do a, make a move, if you will, and change them, some things up. And he said, set Apart. It's one word in Greek, aphorizo is the word in Greek, and it literally means to mark off or to set aside or to give, a, give, a, put aside for a specific task and purpose. Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, I imagine that that would have been shocking to Saul of Tarsus, as we know him, Paul, because he was still a young Christian. It wasn't too long before this that Saul, who was in Jerusalem at the highest ranks as a Pharisee and as kind of a mafia leader, if you will, of the Pharisaical zealot group, was on his way to Damascus to, to crush out and eradicate this movement called the Way that is followers of Jesus. He was on his way to Damascus, probably in his 20s, you know, with a, with a head full of, of, of zealousness and, and religiosity and Old Testament law and rules, and he was going to show these Christians who's boss. And that's when Christ intervened in his life, literally knocking him off his high horse. Isn't that great when the Lord does that? <laughs> it doesn't feel good, but when he knocks us off the high horse of ourself, it's to get our attention and to say, it's not about you, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth. And then Saul goes out to Arabia for three years, kind of to unlearn or detox, if you will, himself and learn what it, what it really means to, to know God. And then he comes to Jerusalem, and we're not sure how long he's there, but he meets Peter and, and the other. Then he goes back to his hometown, Tarsus, modern-day Turkey. In the ancient world, it's called Asia Minor. He goes back there, and he, he's kind of hiding out in some ways. I mean, he's preaching, he's doing God's work, but Barnabas, who's in Antioch, maybe a hundred, couple hundred miles away or so, maybe, for, maybe a little further than that, he's there. At some point, he realizes, you know what? Saul of Tarsus has to be here. I've got to go find this guy. And travels up the coast along up into Tarsus and finds Saul. There was no email. There was no way to connect. There was, I mean, they had the postal services, but they were by foot, right? And so Barnabas just goes out on this hunt to find this guy Saul. I mean, imagine that. No one believed, at least very few. I mean, who is this guy, this, this, 
bounty hunter, you know, who was literally trying to take out Christians, and now he's a follower of Jesus? You think people really embrace that idea? No. Skeptical. It's like a mafia leader or someone from ISIS turning over their lives to Christ. You're going to be skeptical, at least most people, but not Barnabas. Why? Because Barnabas means son of encouragement. He was the encourager. So he goes, Acts chapter 11 says, he brings Saul of Tarsus back to Antioch and they teach the word of God for a year. That's where Paul cuts his teeth, if you will, when it comes to ministry. And so now, after some time, the spirit of God says, Barnabas and Saul, I have a work for you. I have a work for you. And it says, verse three, then after fasting, again, continually and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The idea of laying their hands is they're saying, you're a part of us. You're an extension of us, but we're going to send you off with the favor and the blessing of God. The sentness idea of the church is so important. Now, let me transition here again back to my story. I mentioned my Barnabas. His name is Stuart. And Stuart was in his young 20s, and he was a leader at Young Life. Young Life was a a a Christian ministry in my high school. And a friend of mine invited me to come to Young Life. And I declined. I said, no, I I knew that Young Life was religious, and I didn't want anything to do with religion. I had my music. I had my friends. That's all I needed. I'm good. But she was persistent. And the day of, when uh, Young Life met on Wednesday nights called Club, the day of, she said, you've got to come. It's at my house. Fine. I gave in. I said, okay, I'll come. So I went, and I stood in the back, true story, with my arms crossed, skeptical as you could possibly be. And slowly the Holy Spirit began to work as people would come up to me and say, I'm so glad you're here. You're here. A friend of mine that I'd known for years named Andy, keep in touch with him still, he came up to me and said, oh, wow, Dave, I'm so, it's so great that you're here. This is so cool. I hope you come back. And I'm like, you go here? Because I thought Christians were kind of weird, kind of like out there in these little bubbles. And people were talking to me. And I remember the message. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember the, the, the speaker talked about God's love. And I remember thinking, he's speaking as if he has a personal relationship with God. And I never heard that. If you grew up in a maybe Catholic background or a religious background, you know that sometimes you don't, you don't hear about a personal relationship with Christ. You don't hear about the word of God. You hear about duties and sacraments and, and, and going through these, these acts and formalities. And it drew me in. And then Stuart came up to me. He's like, I'm one of the leaders here. He's like, I'm so glad you're here. I hope you come back. And I said, I will. And afterward, I was like, ooh, did I say that? (laughs) But guess what? I came back. And I came back the following week and the week after that. And then Stuart came up to me one, one time after club. He says, do you have a Bible? And I said, no, I don't have a Bible. He's like, okay. The next week I came. He got me a Bible, an NIV student Bible. I still have it. It's all torn and tattered. He signed it. I thought that was so cool. And then he said, hey, can we get together? We went to the mall. I don't know if people still go to the mall, but that was kind of what we did back then. (laughs) We went to the mall. We hung out. And uh, then he said, hey, would you like to go to Bible study? And I said, what's what's that? I had no vernacular. I had no concept of these ideas, of of these terms. And I said, what what is that? He's like, well, we just get together and we, we study the Bible. I'm like, well, I got a Bible, I guess. Okay. So I came to Bible study, and I'm learning the scriptures. I'm not saved, but the Spirit of God is is alluring me, if you will, and pulling at my heart. And then I was invited to go on a retreat. After about three months of coming to Young Life, going to Bible study, I was invited to go on a retreat. It was 70 miles or so west of Washington in Port Uh, excuse me, Front Royal, Virginia, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, beautiful area. And I remember getting on the bus, and I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like going with the flow, you know. Get on, you know, I was getting on the bus. I had my my flannel shirt that I always wear, long hair, you know, my Vans. I looked like a skater. That's kind of the part I I looked, I guess. I wasn't really a skater, but wannabe, I guess. And then I load load up in this bus, and the speaker that Friday night, I'll never forget, spoke with such passion about Jesus Christ. 
And as I'm listening, my heart is beating faster. And then tears, I start feeling wet tears running down my cheeks as the Spirit of God is convicting me of being a sinner. And I realize for the first time that all the anger and all the pain that I had was a result of I am separated from God Almighty because I'm a sinner. And it was so clear, and it just, it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. And then afterward, the speaker said, if you want to invite Christ in your life, and again, I didn't know what that meant, <laughs> but if you want to invite Christ in your life, then go outside by yourself and ask him into your life. And so I like, was kind of in this emotional state, and I was like, okay, I know what I need to do. I didn't know the terminology, the sinner prayer, sinner's prayer, anything like that. I just knew that I needed Jesus. And so I went outside, found a place by myself, and I looked up, beautiful starlit night, and I looked up and said, Jesus, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to, how to pray, but all I know is that my life is a wreck. My life's a mess, and I need you. Would you come into my life? Would you change me? And immediately I sensed this burden lifting off my shoulders. I just sensed a peace. I was always looking, probably because of my own suffering and growing up in the way I did, I was always looking for this sense of belonging, a sense that, that everything's going to be okay. And at that moment, I knew everything's going to be okay because now Jesus is in my life. And then after that, and I'll go quickly here, after that, it was quick that the Lord started setting me apart and giving me a purpose I started going to a church, the first time going to an actual, like a Bible church that teaches the Bible, McLean Bible Church in McLean, Virginia. And just like Monroe Missionary, it was, the pastor was, was just a godly man who preached the Word of God verse by verse, chapter by chapter, expository preaching. And I'm just like a, like a sponge soaking it all up. So I started going to youth group on Sunday afternoons. And then somebody heard I play guitar, and they're like, hey, would you join the worship team? And I'm like, ah. Uh. <laughs> like, I play, like, electric guitar. Like, you know, I'm kind of the, I have kind of the rock thing going on. I don't, he's like, oh, it's easy. It's just four chords, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. So I got an acoustic guitar, and I started playing in the worship team. Next thing I know, I'm leading worship. I'm like, how did this happen? I'm a guitar player. I'm not a, a leader. I'm not a singer, and I'm leading worship. And then I go off to college, 630 miles away, Fort Wayne, Indiana, small Christian college. And they get word that I play guitar. Hey, would you be a part of the worship team? Because we had chapel three times a week. Okay. And next thing I know, I'm leading chapel. I'm like, how did this even happen? And then they asked me to lead prayer and praise for our whole campus, which was like a couple times a year. We'd all get together for a time of, of repentance and prayer and, and adoration and confession and all that. And the Lord started to do a work in my life. And then I went on my first mission trip to New York City my freshman year. So chapel speaker challenged us to consider missions and the importance of missions. So I went on a short-term mission trip. My dad's from New York. He was born and raised in the Bronx and then grew up in Long Island. My mom's from New Jersey. So I've been to New York City a lot of times. But now we're in Brooklyn, staying in this little mission house, going around working in the streets doing street ministry, going to churches, working with the homeless. And it was like the Lord opened my eyes to see the brokenness in the world and that the church is called to be a missional movement, that is to be the hands and feet of Jesus to a broken and hurting world. And it changed me. Fast forward, it was 1999. I was in Michigan, my first job as a youth pastor. My wife was going to William Tyndale College at the time. She was a biblical counseling psychology major with a minor in cross-cultural ministries. I got to know her family, and it was the blizzard of 1999. And we went out like young kids. She was only 19 years old. I think I was 22, 23. We go out in the snow, bundle all up. We start making snow angels in the, her, her parents' backyard. And then we talk about the gospel. We talk about what, what we want to do in ministry and how we want to be involved in missions, and how we want to be involved with, with in encouraging the church to be involved in missions and, and to be involved with people's, in the brokenness of people's lives, to travel and see, see the gospel transcend uh, through cultures and so forth. And I walked away, and I said, I'm going to marry that girl. 
And I'm like, whoa, whoa, don't, don't say that, you know? <laughs> don't think that. But sure enough, a year later, we get married. She was 20 years old, and we got married 21 on our honeymoon. And here we are all this time later. So let me give you three points of application this morning. Three points of application. Number one is the church is a great medley of Christ, made up of different parts, different personalities, and different giftings. You are the only you there is. And you have a story. You have talents and gifts. You have even brokenness and suffering that is unlike others. And what Christ wants to do is use our brokenness and our messiness and our stories and to kind of mesh that together as in the body so that we can do what we're called to do so that we can edify and, and, and build up the body of Christ. That is that we can do our part. And Barnabas and, and Saul, Paul, Paul the apostle, were a part of that. And the Spirit of God said, hey, I have something else for you. And they were the first, as I mentioned, missionary church ascending church, and the world was forever changed. And that world, that advancement of the gospel eventually reached our world and impacted our lives. And so we are part of this great medley of God's redemptive work through Jesus Christ. Second, number two, is the church is meant and created to be missional at its core. The word missional simply means the idea of being sent. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they, Barnabas and Saul, went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. The idea that we are called out, in fact, the word ekklesia, the word in the New Testament for church, means called out ones. We're to take this and bring it out to the world. This is very important. Do not forsake the gathering together, the assembly of believers. Do not forsake that fellowship. But take this and bring it out there. Jesus says, you are the salt of the light. You are, or sorry, sorry, salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You shall be my witnesses, right? So live and think in this way. One of my heart the heartbeat as a pa- uh, for me as a pastor is to help have create, create an attitude of missions, meaning to help people think about how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus, how we can do our part. And number three, and finally, is be a Barnabas. Be a person of encouragement. Stuart Roll saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And he said, you know what? I'm so glad you're here. Let me, let me invest in your life. Let me encourage you. I was so down and so distraught, and I, I could not even I, didn't even, I couldn't even comprehend all that was going on within me, and someone saw something in me that I could not see in myself because of my own brokenness and blindness. And same with Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas saw something in Paul that nobody else saw. So be a Barnabas. Find someone that you can encourage do your part. Be intentional. You may say, well, I don't, that's not my personality. That's okay. You can pray for somebody. You can make a phone call. You can send a text. You can just say, hey, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? People more than ever right now, folks, as you know, are suffering. They feel alone, invisible, afraid to go out of their houses, uncertain about the future, what to believe, what to think, what news reel to watch, what to do this, to do that. They're just, it's consuming, and people need Barnabases. People need encouragement. And you'll never know the impact that you can make just by encouraging someone, by believing in someone, meaning saying, I see value in you. I see God's work in your life. So let me encourage you to do that. And I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. I hope this sermon encouraged you. I hope you got to know more about who I am. And I hope to see you later today. And if you have more questions, we'd love to answer those questions. And I'm grateful to be here, excited to be here next Sunday as well. Let me pray together, and then we'll have Pastor Tim come back up. Dear Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for the work of the gospel in our lives. And every person in here this morning has a story. 
We are all part of the medley of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And you have called us, you have set us apart. We are the called out ones, the ecclesia. And we are so thankful, Jesus, for that. Thank you for the work you've done in my life. Thank you for my wife being such a Barnabas in my life and, and always being by my side and, and believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. Thank you for the, those who, have, who are Barnabases and, and that, are, that are encouragers. I pray that all of us would look for ways to encourage others. And I pray for Monroe Missionary to continue to have a missional mindset to be the hands and feet of Jesus to a world that's desperately in need of good news. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. We're going to close with a uh, song, so if you could all stand with me, please. Don't forget, tonight at 4 o'clock, uh, you can come for the meet and greet for Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave, thank you for sharing from the Word of God this morning, sharing uh, what God has done in your life, a little bit of that, but we look forward to getting to know you better. Let's pray together, and then we'll be dismissed. God, I thank you that 
as we just saw in the book of Acts, that yes, you were sending people then that you were calling them out to do your work. God, I'm thankful that that hasn't ended, that you continue to do that. And God, I'm thankful to be a part of this church where there's many people here who've been saved by your grace and who know that they've been called out to serve you and to honor you with their life. And so God, as we leave this place here in a moment, I pray that we would engage in the same act that Paul and Barnabas and those other men who were there, that what they were doing, of continuing to worship, of living their life in a way that is worshipful, honoring you in the way that they treat their spouse, their children, that they go to work, that they treat family. God, you continue to work in the midst of that. And so I pray that we would be faithful to that. Yes, God, there are some, I'm sure, here even this morning who you are calling maybe to full-time work in ministry or missions. Yes, that could be true, but God, for most of us, it's just that normal, everyday faithfulness serving you and honoring you. And so help us to do that. And God, as we do that, I have no doubt that you will work in our life. You will work in the people's lives around us because, God, you've done that for thousands of years now. And so, God, we're just thankful that we get to be a part of your kingdom, part of your story. We're thankful for the grace that you've provided us through Christ. So God, help us to continue to worship you again as we leave. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming this morning. Hope to see you later today, this afternoon. God bless.